This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Welcome to the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam and I'm your host. And this week on the podcast, we have a returning guest, uh, Richard's cousin, Dr. Rob Blackaby. He is the president of the Canadian Baptist Theological Seminary in Cochrane, Alberta. And uh, he was with us uh, on episode 244. So you can go back and uh, listen to that if you'd like to. Uh, they reminisce some about Rob's dad and just uh, their relationship over the many, many years. And uh, on today's episode, it's going to focus primarily on ethics and Christian ethics. And uh, it's a fascinating conversation, I think a much needed conversation uh, for those Christians who are in the business world, who are in the church world, in Christian organizations, nonprofits. Uh, it's just a great conversation uh, about how we should conduct ourselves. Uh, what scripture has to say about ethics, and and how do you go about forming that? Uh, so it's it's a fascinating conversation as always with Rob, and Rob mentions a few books at the very end of the show. We'll leave links to those as always uh, in the show notes where you can uh, purchase a copy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Richard. Well, welcome back to this week's podcast. If you have been following us faithfully, you know that uh, I interviewed my cousin Rob Blackaby. And we talked about ethics. Rob has a PhD in ethics, is a uh, president of the Canadian Baptist Seminary in uh, Cochrane, Alberta, that I used to lead, and just a very uh, thoughtful, insightful person. And I really wanted him to give us uh, some uh, discussion on the whole area of ethics. And so uh, we're going to dive in today in talking about, as a leader, uh, how do you deal with a lot of sometimes very sticky ethical issues? And so, Rob, thanks for coming back and clearing up all the questions that we have about that. <laughs> get, it all, get it all straightened away. Yeah, yeah, I've been waiting for this. I've got all my questions piled up. But, uh, but Rob, you're, um, I, I think maybe just to start, we have uh, business leaders who listen to this podcast. We have pastors, people that lead nonprofits. And there are a lot of uh, ethical issues, I think, for leaders. And I probably would put them in for our discussion in two categories. One is our own personal ethical uh, lifestyle choices. How do we treat people that we hire and employees and people of the opposite sex and people of different uh, races? Uh, um, and how do, we, how do we act ethically uh, in the people we relate to? But then secondly, how do we lead a group of people that have, they have to work with one another and they come from very different backgrounds and their own personal ethic and now they've got to fit into a corporate culture that may, uh, they may find offensive uh, based on the way they think uh, things ought to be done and how people should be treated. So, so we'll get into both of those, but maybe just start with, um, you know, we, when we talk about how to develop an ethic, uh, you know, now stuff will come up like, well, you know, how do you deal with some, uh, an employee who's transgender and they, it's a biological male that wants to use the women's bathroom or this is uh, a lesbian uh, employee and she wants same sex benefits, you know, for her partner or whatever. And you're a leader and you're trying to say, well, I, you know, I have a certain ethic of I want to be fair to people, don't want to discriminate against people, but I'm also a Christian and I want to uphold Christian standards. And I, um, and so you're you know you you have something thrown in your face like okay, what are you going to do about this? Um, and a lot of times we have leaders that start scrambling because they've they thought oh no here it comes you know I was worried this would come up one day and now I've got to know what I think. But if you were sitting down with a leader who's facing some dilemmas on what do we do with this situation? Um, where would you tell them to start? I mean, do you, you, okay, now someone wants to use a bathroom that's not their biological, uh, you know, gender uh, bathroom. Um, do you start there? Where do you start in developing an ethic? Yeah, I think uh, our temptation is to start with any given ethical issue, and you've put your finger on one of a million, probably. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's it's important to start with the conviction that 
that our Bible is relevant, hmm. right? Um, that it's the Bible is not some archaic book that is the, just because it doesn't speak to medical assistance in dying <clears throat> doesn't mean that the Bible isn't helpful in helping me to to construct a theology as far as who we are as human beings, mm -hmm. which would lead to an ethic about, okay, this is what I ought not not to do in relation to human beings. And then a morality is how I live. The Bible is very, very instructive, foundational. So I think I have to start there and settle that issue. The mm -hmm. Bible is important to me. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing is I have to settle the issue because um, there's a, I think there may be a popular idea still in Christianity that, um, we live in a morally relativistic world, and mm. and as far as I know, you know that goes back to someone like a Francis Schaeffer, who mm. would say to us in the '60s and '70s, you know, we're listening, we're living in moral relativism, but it seems to be less and less the case. I think we're we're not necessarily living in a morally relativistic world anymore. I think we are living in a world that does believe there are absolutes, and Christians aren't the only ones that believe there are abs there's absolute truth, and that you can violate an absolute law. Hmm. You know, I think that's interesting because I think now lately what has really been uh, front and center for a lot of folks is this sort of attitude that says, yeah, well, what, whatever I feel uh, is true. Whatever, you know, if I believe it if, it, if it's my truth. And so in one sense that can appear to be, well, then you don't really believe in absolute truth because you're, you're, you're basing it on your feelings and your feelings can change. So, you know, as Christians, yeah, we go to the Bible and say, this is true for all time, for all people in all places. But, but then the world often looks like pretty wishy-washy. And right. so you, you might think, well, they just don't even believe in absolute truth, right. but you would, you would push back on that. I think I would, I, w I would, I would actually push back on both sides of that. I, I, I'm not entirely convinced having, <laughs> having walked with uh, people in the church for a, an extended period of time. I'm not entirely sure that Christians don't actually base their opinions on feeling rather than scripture. I, too often, I think we do. Yeah. We say we are people of the book, but, it's, but, but it takes work, as we talked about in, in the other podcast. It takes work to actually dig it. Is this what the passage is actually teaching? Yeah. And not read into the passage something I want it to say based on what I'm dealing with today. It's just a convenient verse. What does the passage really teach? What does that really have to say about the context that I'm living in today? So that and that takes work. Yeah, and you know, I and we've seen this over and over again. I, I you know, I, I'll go back to my own experience. I the way I was just I was raised in a very conservative uh upbringing and you know, the the conservative viewpoint say like on divorce when I was a young person was you, you could, you experienced divorce and you probably don't qualify to be a pastor anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it's probably my early, um, theology. That's kind of where I was. And, and so my ethic would be, boy, just make sure you marry well, because if you don't, you're, you, you may, you know, disqualify yourself to be a pastor. But then I got to seminary and I had at least three friends that were three of the godliest, most devout Christians I'd ever met. And they'd all, for various reasons, suffered an early divorce. Uh, it, you know, in one case, the person had gotten married before he was a Christian. And when he became a Christian, he was like the most sold out Christian he ever met. But that terrified his non-Christian mm -hmm. wife. And she left him because he was being too too Christian. That's like, well, that's not, that's not, if you're going to, someone's going to divorce you. That's probably about as good of a reason as any. You, you were just too, too Christ-like for me. I mm. wasn't comfortable with that. And so now I'm, now I'm faced with this dilemma. Uh, I thought that I had just kind of worked out my ethic based on the Bible, but then I met someone and, you know, I think you have to, that's the thing about ethics. You're taking theology and you're kind of having to apply it in the real world. Uh, but at the same time, you don't, you know, you, you have to ask yourself, well, where is this ethic coming from? Is it coming from mm. my experiences? And if I meet a really nice person who's uh, uh, maybe a lesbian, do I, do I say, oh, okay, well, I guess it's okay in that case for her to be a pastor because she's so nice and she's mm. so evangelistic. And, and, or do you say, I, no, I need to develop an ethic 
before almost I, I'm around people. I mean, I, I want my ethic to work. You, you can have really high ethics and then it's impossible to actually do that in real life. But you also want to be careful that every time you meet another person, you have to don't run back to the drawing board and change your ethics once again. Right. Um, and so, how do you do that? Like that's uh, that's why I think ethics is so fascinating. It's I, I know theologians; they can be day, in their office all day developing a pristine theology, right. but right. then you meet some unusual person, and all of a sudden you're questioning your whole system again. Yeah. So, <clears throat> again, I think n- uh, ethics is the natural outflow of theology, and your morals is, is your ethics in action. Um, should, should circumstances cause me to question my ethical belief system? Well, I think that I, I, it can. So then what do I do? Mm-hmm. And, and that's the... That's, the piece where I'd say you have to do work. You have to do work to go back to Scripture and say, so have I believed this because it's what the Scripture taught? Do I believe this because it's tradition? Uh, Because somebody I respected told me this is just the way it is and that settled it for me? If that's what the Bible teaches, then then that's what the Bible... There's no wiggle room. Mm -hmm. If, If it's because that's what tradition handed down to me, then I have to be honest and say, well, maybe that, maybe that tradition wasn't actually rooted in Scripture. Hmm. So if my ethical system is changing it, it has to be because, because I'm, I'm suddenly understanding that that actually is, is not what the Bible taught. Hmm. That yeah. is not what that passage taught. And I was raised in a, in a fundamentalist church that was a wonderful wonderful experiences but fundamentalism in my experience pr- provided a long list of do's and don'ts mm-hmm. supposing that they were all based in scripture but but I as I grew older I realized actually there's a group of these that actually have no no bearing the script I mean the, the scripture doesn't actually teach about this at all as far as a prohibition it's just something we chose not to do Anyway, um, so that would be that would be important for me is to back wow. up and say, okay, is this what the Bible really teaches? Doubts that are not addressed with Scripture are dangerous. Doubts that drive us to Scripture are very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, I think the the challenge for some folks is we'll feel like, well, I just want to be loving. You know, I, mm-hmm. th- these are people doing some things that I have traditionally felt were unethical, that right. were immoral. Um, but as I've gotten to know them, I, you know, I, I, they're really nice people. And I, so I, I, I feel like the loving thing to do is to change my ethics. And right. I would say, well, no, you should be loving and you should never be ju- You should never beat someone over the head with your ethics. But, but also you, you, sometimes you have to just lovingly disagree with someone's lifestyle right. and you, you can, that doesn't, you don't have to shun them. You don't have to insult them, condemn them, right. but you, but you also don't compromise what you feel from scripture is right. what God says is the right way to live or the wrong way to live. And and that brings us to, to a comment you made earlier, which is, I, I don't know. Well, let me rephrase this. <laughs> There is there is a segment I think in our society right now that would say uh, it's not it's not enough that you don't talk about this. We don't even want you to think about this. So there are some thought police out there, uh, yeah. but it, it it would not seem to be the gen the average person that I meet. I think the average person doesn't have a problem with you believing what you want to believe. Matter of fact, that may be a <laughs> that may be a banner of North American culture right now is believe mm. what hey good for you. Mm-hmm. But the choke point is it's not supposed to actually leave you. It's not supposed to go into the world around you. Hmm. But that's a problem because it always does. Yeah. Right? And so how, as a business leader, it, as a, I lead an institution. How I believe really does affect how I treat other people and how I believe we ought to conduct ourselves as an institution. Um, and so that's, I think, where the pushback comes is, no, you're, you're actually, your beliefs are your beliefs, but they're not supposed to influence how, what, 
what you think or do outside of your own home or yeah. possibly outside of your own study closet because it's not even supposed to influence others in your family. Mm-hmm. But that's, biblically, that's impossible. Yeah. Well, and so, you know, I, like, the, 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 there's so many challenges uh, coming up now. So, like, for instance, if you, if you have, if you, if you want to be uh, just to everyone, you want to be, mm. treat everybody fairly, they're all in the, created the image of God, regardless of whether they're Christian or non-Christian in your denomination or a different one. Um, and so you, you want to develop a culture, a, a work environment where everybody can say, hey, the boss treats me justly. Uh, mm. I, the way he pays me, the way right. he evaluates me and the way he holds me accountable. Uh, and then you... And then you have maybe, say, a transgender employee who says, well, I, I'm a biological male, but I want to use the women's bathroom. And you, in your ethic, perhaps you say, no, we're going to just go by biology when it comes to bathrooms in, in the office. Um, because we want to also honor biological uh, females who don't want a biological male in the bathroom with them. Right. Uh, but then they say, but that's unjust. Right. You know, my sense of justice is right. I should be able to go to the bathroom that I identify with. And now here you're trying to provide an overall culture of justice in the workplace. But now you've got an employee who says you're not being just. Yeah. And of course, they have their system as opposed uh, to the one you perhaps are trying to lay over your, your company culture. Uh, maybe just give one other example and then just have you kind of unpack that. Actually... And again, this is just, I, I just share it because I just remember it from years ago when I was doing your job and, uh, and leading your school, uh, there was, uh, we, you know, we had various accrediting meetings and accrediting agencies would have a, an annual conference or whatever, and we'd try to be represented there. And I remember one time uh, my academic dean uh, came to see me, he's a male, and he said, you know, there's this meeting and we feel like we need to be represented there. And I need to actually ask, I need to meet with some of those folks about our own accreditation while I'm there. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all for that. That sounds good. Well, the other person from our faculty that in, in that particular meeting should have gone was uh, the registrar at that time. But the registrar is a woman. And so we've got a married man, a married woman. And so the dean brought it up to me and said, I think that she'd be the right person to go, but how do you feel about, you know, two married people traveling together? We're, obviously, we're not staying in the same hotel room, but we're in the same hotel in a different city. We, we're probably going to eat meals together because we're the only, we know each other and so on. Is that, what do we do with that? Hmm. Of course, like, they're both godly people. They both were moral people to this day. They're both happily, faithfully married to their spouses. You know, that they've never done anything immorally. I had no reason to suspect in any way that there was anything. But he's bringing it up to me and saying, but, you know, I, I, I just, I want to, we're a Christian school, Christian organization. We, we don't even want the appearance of wrongdoing. But, but is that discriminating if I don't let her go to this meeting and get to, be in this nice hotel and meet other registrars from all over the, the, the continent? Is, are, am I somehow harming her? Because is this an unrealistic ethic to say we don't just send a male and a female, especially if they're both married? Uh, like, how do you, you know, I, I don't know if we, I can't remember now. We came up with a policy after that. But but we're, we're trying to just protect, you know, how do you protect your staff from, and of course some people will take offense at that and say, you discriminate against me. Just because I'm a married woman, you, you didn't let me go to that conference and stay in that nice hotel. And but you or, know, he, or he could have been... Told, yeah, or he, or he, could, he could have sent her and said, he, I'll stay yeah, back. Or, or like, do you send a third person so that there's three people at lunch and three people on that airplane instead of just two? And, you know, I mean, there are a number of ways... Um, to deal with that, but um, but that but the dean actually brought up to me. He saw the potential uh, issue, and not that he didn't trust himself. He was more of an appearance thing and a, and a policy thing going forward. Do you, do, you know what's our policy on this? And I think there's just you, you can think, well, you just hey, we're all adults here. You know, this is a grown up world, and but there's just so many cases of immorality and and 
and adultery and so on that I think especially whether you're leading a Christian organization or you're just a Christian who wants to have high morals and ethics in your culture, even if it's a secular company, you know, how do you, how do you process that? Because there's just a thousand different issues that can come up. Mm-hmm. Anytime you've got a group of people working together in an office space and traveling together and so on, stuff happens and we're, we're human. And yeah. so you're the leader and you want to have a culture of high ethics. How do you, how do you deal with issues like that? So, so, um, first I would say, uh, what is, th- there are, there are others who can be helpful. Like, um, this is probably, doesn't matter it, it would seem to me it would seldom, if ever, matter what the issue is. Somebody else has already dealt with it. Yeah. So, so s- stop living in isolation and start accessing a community of. I mean, these are these are devoted Christ followers who are saying we can help you with this. Hmm. So access that. Uh, get some advice from people who are, are there in the business world saying, you know, listen, well, this is how we handled it. Yeah. So that's that's one. Number two is be open to correction from people. Just because you believe, uh, well, can we, maybe you maybe you're puritanical. Maybe you're a Pharisee. Maybe you shouldn't have taken that pr- particular stance. Why don't we ever see ourselves in the role of the Pharisee? Mm-hmm. Sometimes we are. And hmm. Jesus, like you, you're really interesting. How heavy you tie burdens on other people, but you yourselves don't actually get underneath the load. So maybe I, I need to be open to correction and say, you know what, we thought that was protective, but that that wasn't the best way forward. Mm. And, and then I'll then then we apologize and say we were wrong. Mm. And there's a better way to go about it. Mm. Um, I think it's um, giving each other grace that um, two people who are seriously studying the Word of God, going back to some of your prior examples, with marriage and remarriage, you know, there are people who don't agree and until Christ returns, I don't suppose there'll be unanimous opinion mm-hmm. on this. And we're talking about people who are devoted to the word of God and they want to be, they want to be faithful to yeah. the word of God and they don't agree on this issue. Mm-hmm. Can we just, th- th- these are people that I think we need to have a gracious conversation with yeah. and give room because your business responds, you you understand scripture, you've taken counsel from people who have been really helpful, and this is how that you've you've navigated through this issue in your business. And you look across the way and somebody else has done it a little different than you. Can you have grace? Can we have compassion on each other? Because yeah. these are complex times and it and we want to interpret God's word accurately, apply God's word accurately. And if if you and I don't agree a hundred percent, we sh- can we just can we stay in this journey together? Yeah. We need each other. You know, and t- two things I maybe just throw in, just as a leader, just my own experience. Uh, one I would say is it's 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 a difficult, sometimes circuitous road to try to figure out. Okay, what? How does the the truth of Scripture apply in this situation where the Bible never speaks of specifically? Don't, don't speak about bathrooms and how to deal with that, uh, or, or you know, traveling on airplanes and staying in hotels together. Uh, you know, they, you're going to be hard pressed to find an exact uh, occasion where that's addressed. But uh, but work that through, and then the hard thing sometimes is being consistent. Yeah, you know, and so I'm kind of like, okay, well, yeah. I, so I'm not going to let that person go on the trip. But then a, a, a slightly different scenario happens, and you kind of you, you decide to go easy on them and let them go, and then so right away you've got well, now that now your ethics seems really arbitrary. You're you you were really strict with that right. that group, and now you're being kind of lax with that, and so. You can't do that, especially in a in a company culture. You, you you're going to have to be consistent. That's why you got to work it through to say, can I, if I take this stance, can I be? Will I be constantly tempted to make an exception? Right. Or is this something I can pretty regularly just apply across the board, even to myself as the CEO, uh, and keep it strict? And then the other thing I would just say is. Um, and I, I kind of, that's what we kind of did with the dean and the registrar is I, when in doubt, go 
con- go conservative. <laughs> I just say mm-hmm. if if you feel like some red flags are coming up, or in this case, you know, I had a, a, an employee that they were the ones bringing it to me, and they were feeling uncomfortable. Again, not because they thought anything was going to happen, but they worried about perception and mm-hmm. maybe how spouses might perceive it. And so, you know, my just general rule of thumb was if don't don't dismiss that too quickly, uh, mm-hmm. especially if it's a Christian organization, just when in doubt, always take the high road, always just be extra safe, better to be extra safe than extra loose. And so, and especially if, you know, you, you assume the Holy Spirit is working in your Christian employees, and if they have a caution in their spirit, I just, I just find you're going to have far fewer regrets if you heed that mm-hmm. check in your spirit, because even the best policies are going to have loopholes and unusual circumstances. And sometimes I think as a Christian leader, you just have to trust the Spirit of God to help you navigate those kind of ambiguous circumstances sometimes. And if you're not humble, working through this myriad of ethical issues, uh, I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how you stay, how you maintain a, a prideful posture because um, to say this is how I understand God's word, this is how I understand the application of God's word, and and to do that in a very humble way. Yeah, and you know I think one of the real issues now for Christians, especially if you're leading a secular business organization, is uh, it, it can appear that you're imposing your morals on or your religion on employees who don't hold to your religion they're not maybe not christian so uh and you know i'm familiar with some cases where a christian ceo had a marketing department come up and want to use very risque advertising sexually oriented advertising and the christian uh didn't want to do that didn't want his product to be associated with that uh that he would consider immoral uh, but the marketing department is like, hey, th- we're just driven by increasing yeah. sales, and and you can't let your religion, you know, cost us sales because you're prudish and moralistic here, and you just keep your faith, um, you know, to yourself, but don't let it affect your business. Well, okay, but but like I said uh, in the prior podcast, uh, we all we're all moral people. Mm-hmm. Christians aren't the only moral people. We all have morals. So have the integrity to actually say, this is actually where my morality is shaped. This is how my morality is shaped. My morality is shaped. You don't have to agree with me, but my morality, as best as I can can help it, my morality is shaped by my understanding of God's word. Mm-hmm. But, but that doesn't mean, so you can't, I think the the comment would be, I don't want your your biblically based Christian morality to influence me. Okay, so you would rather have a secularly influenced, you know, secular humanistic morality influence. Okay, but your mor- your morality and my morality are now obviously in disagreement. I I'm, but right now I'm the CEO, mm-hmm. so I I'm just telling you my morality is what's going to take the day. Yeah, and I think that's a great point because even people who aren't professing Christians still have a, a morality. For sure. And they're... It's impossible to have an amoral political system. Yeah. For example, it's, it's impossible to have an amoral work environment. People, we are moral beings. It's just what's informing my morality. Mm. And there are some issues, you know, that are not as necessarily as hot button issues, but even even something like just as a Christian saying we're going to be honest. And so yeah. we, we have to make sales, but we're, we, I never, as a CEO, I never want you to stretch the truth, never to mislead. Right. Um, but the problem is that we have a competitor who actually has a better product than we do right now. And so if people ask us, ask you point blank, is this your product? You know, if, if I had to buy one and everything else being equal, what, which one is higher quality you either have to lie and say well ours is just as good or you got to tell the truth and say well you know i you probably for what you're looking for they're probably going to give you better value right now um that is really tough right that i mean 
a, a business that always tells the truth and, and you're in sales or you're being paid by commission, yeah. um, that can get very controversial. And and yet that's an ethic, isn't it? Are, are we going to be right. honest in how right. we conduct ourselves? And the moment that you begin to give permission not to always be honest, okay, and now when you're making sales, you right. have to you, you don't have to be honest, but when you turn in expense reports, we're expecting you to be very honest, but, but right. now I've sent you two different messages. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, that's exactly right, I think. And, and, and telling the truth also is like, okay, to use your example, um, okay, you know, I'll admit in this particular area, they're, they're slightly superior to us, but that's not the only thing that we're going to talk about. Cause that can be also truthful about the fact that, um, yeah, but, but we're available to you 24 mm-hmm. seven and mm-hmm. our people are, are really aggressively trained to help you quickly and thoroughly. And so I can also be tr- truthful about that. Yeah. Right. right. So, so, and the fact that you tell the truth, uh, like if, if you, especially if they're going to be an ongoing customer, uh, I'd rather pay a little more and know that I'm always going to hear the truth. Yeah, uh, there's right. some value in that too. So. How much would people give right now to know that you know when this person when this person speaks, take it to the bank. Yeah, this person's being as truthful. They're not self motivated, self interested. They're just telling me the truth. I think people would are hungry for that. Who do well, I trust? And I think ethics tends to have the long-term view, right? Like you, yeah, if, you're you, right. if you're going to tell a white lie and make a sale today, that's fine. But like people figure out you're a liar and right. they stop coming to you for business down the road. Someone that always tells the truth, you might miss a sale to in the short term, right. but long-term loyalty of customers. Uh, you know, I, I'm willing to pay more for someone I trust. I know it's going to do quality work that I can always call back and fix something that's not right. Uh, that they always answer their phone and you know respond back quickly. Yeah. Uh, that's worth that's worth something. There's value there, but so ethics I think tends to take the longer view to say yeah let's let's make yeah, the tough absolutely. decisions and take the high road and it may cost us at times, but maybe we I mean we're always happy to have a customer, but but if I can get loyal customers year in and year out, that's probably yeah. going to be good for business in the long term and patience because it has long view. Our, as Christian ethicists, we have to be patient. Yeah, it's tempting not to be though. <laughs> and I, yeah. and I think you know the challenge for leaders is you may be a person of personal ethics, but uh, but how do you develop a culture that way? You know, there's some yeah. famous examples. You know, like Ulysses Grant. Uh, I I I really I he, he sort of. Uh, he's he's kind of gone down as not necessarily a top leader. Uh, in large part because he was a little too trusting of his subordinates. And so, like when he was the president, uh, he had s- several scandals took place on his watch. But but he personally was never, ever accused or, mm. or certainly convicted of anything unethical. Uh, he was a person of high ethics, high integrity, but he just didn't always police his lieutenants mm. very well. And so... Um, I think that's a challenge for a lot of folks is it's not enough just for you to conduct yourself with high ethics. If you're the boss, how do you infuse that into the culture? Because they're not all Christians. They don't all, they're maybe not, they may be Christians, but they don't have the same conservative view of scripture that you do and, or they just interpret it differently than you do. And, uh, so how do you take, how do you transcend that? And now what becomes your high standards begins to permeate through the rest yeah. of the organization. You know, uh, when I think back to my dad, we talked about him in a prior podcast. Um, one of the things that was really impactful to me is, is, the, is the radical consistency. He wasn't one way at church and one way in the schools and one way with his family. He was the same Will Blackaby no matter mm-hmm. where you encountered him. Mm-hmm. And there's something really refreshing and powerful about that. Yeah. Um, when you're a leader... You, you you know pe- people can sniff out like when you're just putting on airs but but then when the camera's off the lights are off you're a different person yeah so radical consistency this is who I am and then be able to articulate you know that that was one of the weaknesses of the fundamentalism that I felt like I feel like I was raised in was I wasn't allowed to ask questions I wasn't allowed to to know why. Oh yeah, you know, and it's yeah. not just teenagers who ask why; it's adults in a in a work environment. But why? 
can we articulate why? Why don't we lie when we're making sales? Hmm. Why don't? Why is it a value to me as a Christian that uh, I don't misrepresent? Well, God does never re- misrepresent. It's based in the character of God. As far as I understand God, He's He is infinitely truthful. Hmm. So I, as His child, want to be truthful because there's value in truth, hmm. and and there's and there's great damage done through deception, and I. And I don't even see the bulk of the damage that's yeah. done. And I find a lot of times when we're tempted to to uh, forego ethics, it's because we don't. It's a it's a sign that we don't trust God. So mm. if I'm gonna, yeah. if I feel compelled, I've got to lie to make this sale because otherwise I can't trust God to help my my company to prosper or for yeah. us to have a good quarter. So, you know, if I'm gonna just take this shortcut. Um, I, I, it's always really because I don't trust God with my business, with my career, with my finances, and so I'm going to have to compromise here. And someone that is absolutely convinced that if you honor God, God will honor you, you're in a much better place to maintain your high standards regardless of what comes, whether you're popular, whether people yeah. get upset with you. Uh, you know God's got you there, and he'll protect you and guide you along the way. Well, I knew that our time would uh, race by, Rob, and uh, I, I think we're just going to have to just regularly tap into you as we talk about I'd love ethics. It. I think it's just so important uh, for for leaders today in a very complex, confusing world. How do you how, how do you maintain a gut? You know, you don't want to be ugly, don't want to be judgmental, pharisaical, but you also don't want to compromise what the Word of God says. Mm-hmm. And certainly, anything you're leading, whether it's your family. Uh, w- whether it's an organization, a company, um, you you want it to be something that honors God. That that doesn't. You're not trying to build a great company by dishonoring uh, your God and your faith. And so that that gets very complicated sometimes. Um, and uh, and I, I, maybe I don't know. Just put you on the spot, here, Rob. There's any if there was a book or anything that you could recommend. Um, uh, to say, hey, if you'd like to just do some reading on how to think ethically, is there any yeah. person or book or place you'd start? Well, there's people? some favorites, right? Um, when I teach ethics, I, I love Robert Simokwok and mm. Paul Copan's Introduction to Biblical Ethics, hmm. Walking in the Ways of Wisdom. It's it's a it's a powerful book that that is is a really good example of what what does it mean to get into the Bible, understand what the Bible is telling you, and then have see that fleshed out. Hmm. It's been very influential. A more contemporary book um, would be uh, Carl Truman's Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, yeah. or um, his more popular version of those teachings in A Strange New World. Okay. Yeah, those would be some really good places to start. Good. Well, we'll get those in the show notes. And uh, maybe just the last thing, we'll also put uh, the website to the seminary there. I'd you, love that. You have, uh, you're doing a great work training uh, church planners, pastors, uh for hard places, and uh, and I know you depend a lot upon donors. You depend on people volunteering to come and help. Whether it's an electrician coming yeah. to help fix uh, student housing units, um, doing yard work, uh, planting flowers. There's just so many things. If you just would love uh, an excuse to go to the Canadian Rocky Mountains and uh, serve the Lord, do some mission work, and then go to Lake Louise right. uh, on the weekend. We can help you. Uh, <laughs> check out the website. Um, I, you know, I led the, that school for 13 years, and I can't tell you how many donors and volunteers would thank me with tears in their eyes for the just the thrill and the blessing yeah. of being connected with that school. Yeah. And so it's a school I can highly recommend. I'm so thrilled that you're there and leading it so well. And uh, if you ever thought about doing a mission trip, take your family on a trip, or you just want to invest your money in a place that you know is going to be, uh, is going to take good care of the money and, and have the most, and, and deal with it ethically and with integrity. Um, what a great place. And so check them out on the website. Just the views of uh, the Rockies from there is worth it. You have moose running across the seminary property <laughs> at times, uh, eating, eating our trees. Eating yeah. your trees. Yeah. Uh, incredible place uh, to, to go visit and, and to go serve. If you don't want to leave North America, but you want to go on a mission trip and you live in the States, great place to go. So, and they might want to come up in May 2024. There's a spiritual leadership class. Going yeah, on. next. So next year, uh, May twenty twenty four, in twenty four. Yeah, 
um, you and I co-teach a leadership class for a week. And yeah. a lot of folks have done that. This taken a week to go get a seminary class and then spend time in the Rockies on the weekends yeah. and so on. And so, yeah, we'll put the website there and uh, just such a beautiful place. And uh, if you want to do some seminary training, study under me and Rob uh, and serve the Lord and be a blessing to an awesome institution, we I really encourage you to do that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Rob, for Thank being you. with us. It's been a joy. We'll have to have you back for sure. I'd like it. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners. So email us at podcast at blackme.org.